Welcome from St. Andrew Anglican Church in Alliston. Let's begin with a prayer. Almighty God, your Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, is the light of the world. May your people, illumined by your word and sacraments, shine with the radiance of his glory, that he may be known, worshipped, and obeyed to the ends of the earth. He who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The first reading that we read last Sunday in church came to us from the first book of Samuel, chapter 3, verses 1 to 20. It's a very, very popular story in the scripture, talking about Samuel's calling and prophetic activity. It reads, Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord under Eli. The word of the Lord was rare in those days. Visions were not widespread. At that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his room. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called, Samuel, Samuel. And he said, Here I am, and ran to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But Eli said, I did not call lie down again. So Samuel went and lay down. The Lord called again, Samuel. Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, here I am, for you called me. But Eli said, I did not call my son, lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. The Lord called Samuel again a third time, and he got up and went to Eli and said, here I am, for you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. Therefore, Eli said to Samuel, go lie down. And if he calls you, you shall say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Now the Lord came and stood there, calling as before, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, speak for your servant is listening. Then the Lord said to Samuel, See, I am about to do something in Israel that will make both ears of anyone who hears of it tingle. On that day I will ful fulfill against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. For I have told him that I am about to punish his house forever for the iniquity that he knew because his sons were blaspheming God and he did not restrain them. Therefore I swear to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be expiated by sacrifice or offering forever. Samuel lay there until morning, and then he opened the doors of the house of the Lord. Samuel was afraid to tell the vision to Eli, but Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son, here I am. Eli said, what was it that he told you? Do not hide it from me. May God do so to you. And more also, if you hide anything from me at all that he told you. So Samuel told him everything and hid nothing. Then he said, Eli said, it is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. As Samuel grew up, the Lord was with him and let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, knew that Samuel was a trustworthy prophet of the Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I have a short talk here. And um, may only God's truth be spoken. May only God's truth be heard. The theme from this reading we just heard could go in a few different directions. It could One of those is God's call upon our lives, similarly to God's call upon Samuel's life. And another is mentoring the younger generations, as Eli did for Samuel, so that they are able to hear the call of God in their life. How wonderful would that have been when we were young? Some people may have had that, but many, many more did not know how to hear the call of God on their life. I was reading a, a story of a pastor who held a Thursday evening program after which those in attendance were charged with going out 
and sharing the gospel with people they didn't know. And then coming back at the end of that and describing their experiences. He says on one occasion, he asked the group, so what did you pray for as you left the building and, and started out to knock on doors? And one young man responded in refreshing candor, I prayed nobody would be home. I wonder how often we feel that way. I've never done that. It's it's so Jehovah Witness to knock on people's doors that you don't know. And yet this was an evangelical church in the States. So Christian churches do do this. People in Christian churches do this. Have you? Have you ever knocked on a door of someone you didn't know to share the gospel or walked up to a complete stranger on the street or in a store and started talking about God? Witnessing about our faith seems so difficult. We always shy away thinking it will be an imposition on people who don't really want to hear what we want to share. But what did Jesus say about that in Luke 9, 26? He says, if anyone is ashamed of me and my message, the Son of Man will be ashamed of that person when he returns in his glory and in the glory of the Father and the holy angels. We don't want that, do we? We do not want Jesus to be ashamed of us because we were ashamed of him and our relationship with him, and we were afraid to share that so that people knew that we knew him. So where do we start then? It's been suggested we must learn to start at home or wherever God has us, telling people about Jesus. There's a story Paul Harvey told entitled Sparrows in the Winter. It really resonated with me because the other night it was so cold and blizzardy out. In the winter, we have two or three sparrows that come into the barn, and I was hoping they were in before I closed the doors for the night. Paul Harvey tells a story about a raw winter night on which a farmer heard a, a thumping sound against the kitchen door. And he went to a window and watched his tiny shivering sparrows, attracted to the warmth inside, beat in vain against a glass storm door. The farmer bundled up and trudged through fresh snow to open the barn doors for the struggling birds. He turned on the lights, he tossed some hay in a corner, and sprinkled a trail of saltine crackers to direct them to the barn. But the sparrows hid in the darkness because they were afraid of him. He tried various tactics, circling behind the birds to drive them toward the barn, tossing crumbs in the air toward them, retreating to his house to see if they would flutter into the barn on their own. But nothing worked. He had terrified them. The birds could not understand that he was trying to help them. He withdrew to his house and watched the doomed sparrows through a window. And as he stared, a thought hit him like lightning from the clear blue sky. If only I could become a bird, one of them, just for a moment, then I would not frighten them so I could show them the way to warmth and safety. At that same moment, another thought dawned on him. He had grasped the whole principle of the incarnation, God coming to dwell among us as a human. God coming to dwell among us as a human in Jesus, to be like us, but without sin, to help us. Jesus would show us the way. Life without God feels like those birds beating against a glass door in vain in the cold and dark, scared with the threat of perishing looming over them. Like that pastor's group that went out to share the good news, that there is a way into safety, into a warm barn, into the loving kingdom of God. But who would tell them about it? You? Me? How? When? It is important in every generation that God's people hear his call in their lives. That way they can find their way, the way prepared for them before they were ever born. 
Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Those plans are for everyone. God has those plans for everyone, but many don't know it. How does God communicate those plans? He speaks through those he, he calls, like Samuel and, and you and me. And it's important to understand that God's call can come to anyone at any stage in his or her life. People in every generation need to hear God's call and do the very best they can to carry that call out. No doubt the priest Eli had experienced many successes in his ministry. But he had also experienced his share of failures. The Bible tells us that the Lord decided to take the leadership away from the family of Eli because of the sins of his sons and Eli's inability to correct them. Leadership could not be passed on to Eli's sons, so it was going to pass to Samuel instead. And during this time with Eli, things were not good. We are told the word of the Lord was rare in those days. Visions were not widespread. Then we are told that Eli's eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see. Eli's encroaching physical blindness symbolizes the increasing spiritual blindness of him and his generation. But hope is not lost. For where Samuel was lying in the temple, the lamp of God had not yet gone out. The physical reality of the still burning lamp symbolizes the fact that God's light might still break through the spiritual darkness that seemed to permeate the land. Samuel was lying down in the temple, in the temple of the Lord when he heard God's voice. It is possible that the young man was participating in a ritual whereby he slept in the tabernacle near the ark of the covenant in order to put himself in a position to hear the voice of God. When our own youth at St. Andrew and their moms and I stayed overnight in the church last summer for the Alpha Holy Spirit weekend, it's incredible when you're in that sacred place and there's only a few candles burning and it's quiet and it's dark. You listen. Your senses are very sharp. And we were really hoping to hear a word from the Lord. There's something about coming into a sacred space like this with expectation. And often on those quiet Wednesday prayer times when the church doors are open at 12 until 12 noon until 1 p.m., people come with a hope and an expectation that they will receive something from God a word, a vision, comfort, peace, healing. We come with expectation. And often we are not disappointed. We leave with more than we came in with. You wonder then, did Samuel's mentor Eli guide him into that situation, hoping he would hear from the Lord at some point? Those of the older generation need to encourage our young people to put themselves in a position to hear God's call in their lives. And we can do that by making sure that our children are in worship, in a small group, or on a ministry team so that they learn how to listen for God's voice. The next generation is responsible to hear for themselves, but the older generation is responsible to teach them and to help them to listen and hear. Samuel mistook the voice of God for the voice of Eli. Discerning God's voice takes time and patience. Also people to help mentor and guide. Revelation often comes in threes. Samuel heard God's voice three times before Eli realized it was God. And when God guides us, it's the same. We often hear three times as well. It may not be in exactly the same way all three times, but the message will be consistent. It might be a warning or a message, a new direction, 
or it may be guiding you to a source of help. If our younger generation are put in a position to hear the call of God, they might just hear it. But they need help with discernment, just as we do, coaching. And for Eli, he had to face the fact that the leadership of Israel was being taken away from him and his descendants. He also had to face the hard fact that it was being taken away because of the personal failings of himself and his family. Those in the present generation of leadership are faced with the challenge of facing and owning up to our own sins and shortcomings. I'm wondering how God is working in all of that. I can't help but think in this complex day and age, many are going in their own ways, like Eli and his sons, and becoming spiritually dull so as not to be able to hear God trying to correct their course. Passing the baton onto the next generation can be hard as well. As Eli appropriately confessed, it is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. We need to have faith that through or in spite of what we have done and, or, and are doing, God is working his purposes out. Often the Old Testament prophets were called to proclaim a message that was hard for people to hear and hard for the prophets to speak. The funny thing is people think the Old Testament is a, is a testament of judgment, but if you read the New Testament, you're going to see the same things. Jesus is very clear about judgment and what is expected. Samuel was afraid to tell Eli what God had said to him because that message contained negative words about Eli's family. Those in the new generation need to be open to the call of God on their lives, and that may, means facing squarely and speaking boldly the word God gives them to say. If they have to say things that are hard for the old guard to hear, so be it. If they have to say things that will be difficult for their own generation to hear, then so be it. It is far more important to be a God pleaser than a people pleaser. Far more important. There are significant challenges to all generations in hearing God's call. But faithfulness requires that we face them. I want to close with the story about the sparrows and the farmer's wish that he could become a bird, if only for a moment, to help the other sparrows to find their way to safety and warmth. Consider this. A man's becoming a bird is nothing compared to God's becoming a man. The concept of a sovereign being as big as the universe confining himself to a human body is too much for some people to believe. And yet he did it. He did it in our Lord Jesus Christ. And I know he did it because I have stood beside my Lord Jesus Christ and experienced his manifest presence. And it's also amazing. When you look back at that, saw at Psalm 139, it reveals that God knows you. God knows you and everything about you. And he yearns to talk with you and to help you and to guide you and to teach you. I wonder can you hear him calling you? Johnny Erickson Tata, in her new book, The Practice of the Presence of Jesus, shares these insights as she asks, Why were you born? Why were you chosen? For what purpose were you born? These are larger than life questions. But their answers are simple. Just read 1 Peter verse 9 or chapter 9 verse sorry 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 9 Long before the universe was created God called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light so that you might proclaim the excellence of Jesus 
That same calling is given in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 11 to 12. In Jesus, we were also chosen in order that we might be for the praise of his glory. You were born to make Jesus look great. You were saved to prove to others his trustworthiness. And you were chosen to share this good news with everyone. Once you start living this way, you will be to the praise of his glory. So start making Jesus look good by how you live, by how you treat your husband, your wife, your children, your neighbor. Make Jesus look good by being honest, by thinking the best of others, and not keeping a record of people's wrongs, by subduing rebellious thoughts. And you really, really make Jesus shine by trusting him, for you are proving that his word is utterly reliable, that he is really as good as the Bible says he is. And the harder it seems to trust Jesus, the better he looks when you do. In heaven, it'll all come so naturally. To praise him there will be effortless, for we will finally understand the depths of his grace in covering the worst of our sin. So we need to start practicing for that glorious day. It's our primary occupation on earth. It's why God saved us in the first place. Matthew 6, 26 says, Look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns. For your heavenly Father feeds them. And aren't you far more valuable to him than they are? Let us close with a prayer. Amen. Oh, loving God, we know that you hear the heartfelt needs that arise within us. We voice our concerns, needs, hopes, and dreams to you this day. And we come acknowledging that we often pass unaware of your presence along our pathway, just like Samuel, not recognizing your voice right away. Yet we know that we live, move, and have our being in you. We know that you're in the sky, the flowers, the trees, the lakes, and the faces of children. In you, we are. You are in the hurts of those in need and in the lives of people we love. Teach us to see you and hear you wherever we are and wherever you are. You are with us. Teach us to be sensitive to your presence and to the needs of those around us. As we pray in the one who is most sensitive of all, Jesus Christ, our Lord, amen. And a blessing. The Lord Jesus Christ, son of the living God, teach you to walk in his way more trustfully, to accept his truth more faithfully, and to share his life more lovingly, that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may come as one family to the kingdom of the Father. And the blessing of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit be with you, and not with you only, but also with all those you love, here and in the hereafter. And I want to challenge you. I'm not going to ask you to go and knock on doors. But I am going to ask you. There was a beautiful lady we had in our parish who's now in heaven. She's graduated, Audrey. And she used to get up each morning and she would say to her Lord, Lord God, help me to be a blessing to someone today. And she was. She was a beautiful blessing. And she loved her Jesus. And uh, she spoke of him often with everyone. I encourage you like Audrey. Ask God to help you be a blessing to someone this week so that you may share your faith with them. Your faith in our Lord Jesus Christ and what he has done for your life, so that you may give them hope of what he can do in theirs. That's what we're called to do. That's why we've been chosen. You are God's, and he loves you so very, very much. Amen. Amen, amen, and amen.